Amen. You can be seated. I pray you have your Bible. Turn to Esther chapter 2 as we make a journey through this book. One of the things that you need to remember is when God does not seem to be present nor visible, He is always on the scene. As you read through the book of Esther, the name of God nor a reference of God is even ever mentioned. Two books of the Bible where those two are are two books that are ne- the, God, the name of God's not mentioned is the book of Esther and the book of Song of Solomon or the Song of Songs. And so many folks would say, why would this book even be listed in the canon of Scripture? As a matter of fact, I shared this last Sunday. Martin Luther, who was uh, instrumental in the Reformation age, was the one who decided or debated on whether or not the book of Esther was really supposed to be in the canon of Scripture. And so you say, why would a narrative, why would a historical narrative of a, of a lady named Esther and a man named Mordecai and a man named Haman and a king called Ahasuerus a or Xerxes be in the Word of God so that people in 2024 could gain and glean a spiritual insight to who the Lord is and to practically live that out throughout the week. Well, here it is. There is oftentimes in our lives where the things of the world, the darkness of the world, seems to be thwarting the light of the gospel. And I want to encourage you that absolutely nothing in this world can keep the Lord and who He is and the sovereign work of what He's doing from completing the task. Amen? That he's going to complete. So with that being said, let's kind of review for those that were not here over the last couple of weeks. Uh, I was going to do two messages per chapter, but chapter two is really not going to happen. That's not going to happen, okay? It's probably going to be three or four. And so as we go through chapter one, it's basically a historical background or backdrop of all the stuff that goes on. As a matter of fact, we don't even meet the main characters to chapter three or all together. Uh, Today we're going to basically look at verses 1 through 5. I want want you to keep your Bible open because one of the things in a a narrative, particularly a historical narrative, that you got to do is you got to read the whole book. So let me encourage you to go home and read the whole book of Esther so you know the whole story. And then as we look at details, it begins to make sense to you. And not only do you need to read it once, you probably need to read it three or four times. Does that make sense? And so with that being said, I want you to understand Esther is not the main subject of this book. We don't know who wrote the book of Esther. It happened in the time of Daniel and Ezra and Nehemiah. Daniel is a book that's recording that Daniel lived in the king's palace and was able to live off of the the riches of the king. Esther wins a beauty contest, is in poverty and gets there. Ruth is one who lives in poverty and goes to be in the kinsman redeemer. Amen. And so as we look at those Hebrew narratives, there's a couple of things that I want us to just really gain from insight this, this morning as we set the platform, as we get into Esther and Mordecai and Haman and all the things that go on amongst that bunch as we walk through this. Y'all ready? Say amen. There's a couple of things I want you to remember in chapter 1. I share with you guys that each one of these are allegorically or, or they're symbolically uh, a picture of us. As a matter of fact, Paul used... Uh, the term Satan or dragon or devil to do what? To symbolize Satan, a serpent. He used Abraham and Isaac as an allegorical understanding of law and grace. Jacob and Esau. And so as we come to this book, we need to understand three things. Number one. Ahasuerus, the king, is a picture of the soul of man. Number two, Haman is a picture of the flesh. Mordecai is the picture of the Holy Spirit of God. And if you want a a fourth allegorical understanding, Esther would be the bride of Christ, the church. Now, we're in a spot that is not a very good spot in chapter 2 because of what really goes on. And if I was to go into detail, there would be some mamas and daddy cringe at really what goes on. And so the subject of this book 
is getting the right man in the palace so the wrong man can get out. Does that make sense? In other words, every one of us in this room is born with a darkened soul where the, the man Haman is inside of you that you're going to live by your Adamic nature, by the flesh, and by the Spirit of God as he comes and moves on the inside, then the only way, listen to me, the only way you can deal with your flesh is by death. And the gallows are waiting for the Haman in, uh, the Haman in your life. Amen? And so as we walk through this, over the last two weeks we've seen the king being what? Easily manipulated. Man, your soul, your life, you run off of emotions. When things don't go your way, we can be critical and we can get to the point that we get bitter. And so therefore we're easily manipulated by our emotions and listen to me, the advice of the world. And so last Sunday as we looked at those people, those companions that we gather around us, those seven and seven, we see that in the souls of human beings, after the fall, what are we? We're, dri we're really driven and influenced by emotions. Even though we were created, Adam was created to have dominion, now what's happened? Our souls have become weak and we run off of our five senses, what it looks like, what it sounds like, what it smells like, what it tastes like, and what it feels like. And if it don't, none of those add up, guess what we do? We find people that agree with who we are. Amen. And so in the text that we read today, I pray you have your Bible continue to stay open because we're going to go further than, ver than five verses. But there are three important truths that I want us to allow to permeate our minds and infiltrate our hearts that we can practice living with an understanding of who we really are outside of a relationship with the Lord Jesus. Amen? So let's look at verse 1 through 4. Again, after these things, when the wrath of the king Ahasuerus subsided, he remembered Vashti, what she had done and what had been decreed against her. Then the king's servants who attended him said, Let beautiful young virgins be sought for the king, and let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of his kingdom, that they may gather all the beautiful young virgins to Sushan, the citadel, in other words, the capital of the area, into the women's quarters, women's quarters under the custody of Hegai, the king's eunuch, custodian of the women, and let beauty... Preparations be given them, then let the young women who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. Now we read verse 5 and it's going to be the prelude to what we're going to be discussing next Sunday if the Lord doesn't come back and allows us to get together. But three important truths this morning about this king before we move off into Mordecai and to Esther and to Haman. Y'all ready? Say amen. 127 times the name of King Ahasuerus is mentioned in these chapters in this narrative. Not one time is the name of God mentioned. And so we need to understand what the dominion in our lives is, and it's our flesh. It's, it's our darkened soul until the, the glorious light of the gospel breaks forth into our lives to allow us to understand who He is and who we're not. First thing I want us to understand is this. Ready? Here it is. The process of the king. See, every one of us in this room, we have a process in how we think and how we live. As a matter of fact, some of you this morning got up and did your routine of what you always do. As a matter of fact, some of you guys in here are a sock, shoe, sock, shoe guy. Some of y'all are a sock, sock, shoe, shoe guy. You say, what is that, Brother Brad? Some of y'all put your sock on, then put your shoe on, then put your other sock on, put your other shoe on. Some of y'all put both socks on, then put both shoes on. Some of y'all put your left shoe on before you put your right shoe on. And you know the routine that you have when you brush your teeth or there the lack thereof, how you comb your hair, where you lay your clothes out, how you get together, what you, can I get an amen in the house? And some of y'all don't even realize you do it because we're creatures of habit. So King Ahasuerus shows us how the Adamic nature lives inside of us apart from the Lord Jesus. Why? Because God created man for man to live off the life of God. Because when God created Adam, he breathed into Adam and gave him the light, life, and love of God. And when Adam sinned, the light, life, and love of God left Adam, and Adam then began to try to live off of instinct, and Adam was not created to live off of instinct. Only Adam was, was, to cre was created to live off of instinct, and that's the reason we act like a bunch of animals. That's the reason Nebuchadnezzar went and grazed in the field as an animal. Because when the life of God is not on the inside of you. The only thing you can do is play a part. Amen? And so when Jesus came, what did he do? He came to get Adam out of you and put Christ in him, into you. He came to get you out of Adam and into Christ. He didn't come to get you into heaven. He came to get you out of you and him into you. 
So therefore, if any man desires to come after him, you've got to deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow him. See, the only provision God ever made for you is a cross. It's for you to die to self. And so this king, being weak, this king who's taken counsel from the worldly people has now got to this place, and basically what's happened, it says after these things, basically what's happened is there's been a four-year break between chapter 1 and chapter 2, and I'm going to prove that to you in just a few moments. What's happened is, is he's gone on a campaign to whip the Greeks, and he's lost. He wanted the Persian Empire to be the greatest empire at that time, and in the last four years, he's went out to battle, and he's lost. Now he's come home, and he's contemplating the last four years of his life. That's the reason the title of the message is The King's Regret. If you looked over the last four years of your life, is there any regret in your life? How about this? If you looked over the last four minutes of your life. So what is this process of the king? Well, first of all, I want us to look at the thought process or the setting for the plan. It says, after these things, after what things? After not only chapter 1, but after all the last four years, after these things, after all the banquets, after all the things that they've done in chapter 1, he comes and then he sits down and he's made himself back at home and he begins to remember some things. Amen? And so with that being said, I want us to understand the bitterness that he lived in. See, there's many folks sitting in this room, if you don't deal with the regret in your life, you just simply grow bitter. Did you hear what I just said? And what you'll do is you'll get a critical spirit, and everybody that's around you knows that you have a critical spirit, and nobody wants that with you. Amen. And then it's everybody else's fault. Look at the bitterness of the king. Look at what it says in verse number 1. After these things, when the wrath of the king Ahasuerus subsided, he remembered Vashti. Now remember, in chapter 1, he got angry and he dethroned the queen because she wouldn't come in and parade in front of all of his drunken bro uh, brothers that he had at a banquet. And they got scared and so they made a decree. Now between chapters 1 and 2, four years have passed. It's the years 481 through 479 when Xerxes basically gets whipped and he comes home and he's saddened because he has no queen. He comes home to be comforted and listen to me, he has no queen. And so he sits down and goes something like this. Man, how did I get here? I'm the king of Persia. How did I get here? I've been defeated. And now I come home and have no queen. Well, look at verse 16. Verse 16 tells us that it's in the seventh year of his reign. In chapter 1, verse 3, it says it starts out in his third year of the reign. So I'm not a very smart man, but I did finish elementary school, and 7 minus 3 is 4. So there's been four years between 1, 3 and 2, 16. Y'all got me? So what's happened? What are these after these things? There's been a lot that went on historically in the life of Xerxes. I want you to hear me. One of the greatest battles in history that gets overlooked is this battle. As a matter of fact, it's called the Marathon. You know why? Because a man ran 26 miles to bring word to Xerxes. That's why it's 26 miles in a marathon. That's where we got it. And I know some of y'all going, well, it's 26 point whatever. Who cares? Don't you have a car? <laughs> Amen. I got a guy in my, that I graduated high school with put on his Facebook page the other day that he was glad that he ran a marathon. And if somebody else we graduated with said, why? Amen. Catch a bus. There's no need to run in 26 miles. So the process of the king, what is it? He's bitter. Why? Because in a drunken stupor, he makes a decision in chapter 1. Listen to me. And it don't crop up till four years later. Hebrews 12 says, if you don't deal with bitterness, what's going to happen is it's going to spring up and defile many. Hebrews 12, 12. See, some of you guys are bitter about things that happened years ago, and now it's affecting the people in this room that didn't even know what happened. Amen. Learn to live under the blood of the Lord. Here's what it says. After his wrath had subsided, 
the bitterness of the king. Number two, not only do you see the bitterness of the king, you find the brokenness of the king. In his bitterness, he becomes to be broken because now he's remembering the regrets of his life. Anybody listening to what I'm saying? He begins to think about how things could have been different had he responded different. Because every one of us in this room over the last four years have responded in ways we shouldn't have responded. And we regret it, but our pride won't allow us to admit that we were wrong. Amen? And so what do we do? We just keep getting bitter. And so in the brokenness, he remembers something that is pretty awesome that I want to bring out in the next point because he's barren. What is the barrenness? Man, he's dry. See, when bitterness comes, then there's brokenness, and you can be broken and still not repent. But I don't believe you can repent without brokenness. Did you hear what I just said? You can have regret and remorse and still not repent. What's the barrenness of the king? Watch this. Y'all, are you ready? Open, you ready? He's, he's, he's broken and he's bitter and he's barren. Let me tell you why he's barren because here's what the Bible says. He remembers the decree against her. Here's what it doesn't say. He made the decree. So what is he doing? He's blaming everybody else but himself. He said, let's read it. Here's what it says. What she had done and what had been decreed against her. You understand he had to sign off on it. Even though he took ungodly counsel for some worldly individuals, he was the last voice in it. And so as he sits down and he's in the middle of regret, he was remembering in his brokenness, he will not admit that he was to blame. It's amazing how many folks are convicted by the Spirit of God and never will admit guilt. So with that being said, I want you to notice that in the midst of his drunken stupor, he makes this decree, and now he's lonely and empty. He's hollow. On a day where he could come home, even after defeat, into his palace, he has no queen. There's no one to comfort him. So when everything he's based his life upon falls apart, there's no one in the house to allow him to understand life. See, you can be sorrowful and still not repent. You can be broken and still not repent. But his life is barren now because as a king, being weak, he's the one that should have been making the call. He's the one that should have been doing the, the kingly things. Amen? But because of his weakness, which is a picture of our soul, instead of us having dominion over the world, now the world has dominion over us. So with that being said, watch what happens in verse 4. Instead of dealing with his sin, verse 4 says, Then let the young women who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This thing pleased the king, and he did so. See, here's what happens. Instead of repenting when you're broken and when you're barren and when you're bitter, you'll find blissfulness in comparing yourself to everybody else and you'll just get to feeling better about what you're at, where you are. See, he really hadn't dealt with any of his circumstances, has he? All he has done is surrounded himself with things that make him feel better. Is anybody listening to what I'm saying in this house? See, the process of the king is the process that naturally comes in our lives, in our Adamic nature, that when we're confronted with who we are, this is what we do. We just change our environment. We change our situation. We never change our condition. Most folks just change their location instead of changing their situation. Most folks run from it. Amen? So with that being said, the process of the king is he goes from bitterness to blissfulness. How in the world can a king who's lonely and empty, who has just suffered the biggest defeat of his life, go, hey, I like that? Why? Because he's not concerned about anybody but himself. See, King Ahasuerus is a picture of every man's soul because we're born self-centered. We really don't 
care whether or not anybody else is pleased. More importantly, we're not really concerned if the Lord's pleased. And so the process of the king is important for us to stop and to look at. I wanted to jump into Mordecai and Esther, but we need to, we need to deal with this. Number two. What do we do after the process of the king? We look at the picking for the king. I want to ask you a question. Why didn't they go pick some ugly girl? Did you hear what I just said? Why? Because the three things according to 1 John that is the albatross around our necks is what? The lust of the eyes, the pride of life, the lust of the flesh. Right? So what do we do? We think if we get another job, everything's going to be better. We think if we have a different spouse or we go to a different church or we go to a different school, everything works out. That's a fact. And we never look in the mirror. Michael Jackson said he had to start with the man in the mirror. <laughs> Some of y'all catch that letter. So what is this picking according to verse four, 2 through 4? Well, look at the candidates. Here's what's awesome, Brother Jaime. He got a bunch of eunuchs to go figure out who the women are. Now, I don't know about y'all, but I think my committee on committees would not have had eunuchs in it to go find some good-looking women. Is anybody listening to what I'm saying? I mean, they're eunuchs because they don't think women look good to begin with. Are y'all listening to what I'm saying? I mean, that's, that's really an oxymoron, is it not? So what is he doing? <laughs> he, he basically picks some men to go find some beautiful women so that he can live up to everybody's expectations and not be blamed for the women they've get, that gets brought in. Because if somebody's girl don't get picked, they're going to run down to the palace and go, why didn't you pick my girl? And they're going to say, well, you need to talk to the eunuch. Oh, yeah, by the way, she's a heifer. She's ugly. Can I get a witness in the house? See, he wanted some good-looking women, but he didn't want to blame if somebody got left out. Brother Dennis and I was talking about just the craziness of the day and age which we live in, in church world today. It's amazing to me that when somebody gets mad and leaves the church, it's the church's fault. Why is it that when somebody leaves, the first thing we go, what, what, what do we do to make them mad? Maybe God moved them. Did you hear what I just said? We, we spend more time trying to coach people and keep them here than to be about ministry. I'm telling you, we're going to give an account to God for the money we spend on sending cards and telling people we've missed them in Sunday school. When we get ready to go on the mission field, well, we ain't got no money. You know why? Because we bought in postage stamps trying to get some old boy that got mad because Aunt Sookie had her ingrown toenail cut out and ain't been to church in two and a half years. And now she's upset and everybody, everybody, y'all listen to me, because didn't nobody like her banana pudding last time we had a dinner on the ground. Can I get a witness in the house? That's a fact. And so here's what happens. In the process of thinking, they get inward and then... They begin to live up to everybody's expectation. They get them a bunch of eunuchs. That the king appoint officers. Now watch this. The king gets to appoint officers and all the prophets of the kingdom that they may gather the beautiful young virgins to Nashville at the, at the capital city into the women's quarters under the custody of Haggai, the king's eunuch, custody, custodian of the women, and let beauty preparations be given them. We'll come back to that next week. But do you understand that our souls want people to agree with us? But then we don't want responsibility of the decisions that we make or the actions that we take. Why? We want to blame it on somebody else. Now, we want our voices heard, but we don't want the responsibility of what we've said. That's the reason we can send an email, a text, or get on Facebook and say something and don't think there's any consequences. I just believe we ought to be able to walk and find out where they live. Can I get an amen in the house? So this picking deals with these candidates. You don't understand how clear the Bible is, and I'm just going to give you just a few of them, of what it 
of the instructions that God tells us not to hang around folks that don't have the, the mind of, of Christ. They can be religious but not have the mind of Christ. Let's just walk through some of them. Y'all ready? Here we go. First of all, you got it? You ain't got a clue. Well, it's right here on your piece of paper. Here it is. Number one, Psalm 1-1. Here it is. Blessed is a man who does not, y'all listening? Blessed is a man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. Why? Because here's the process. He does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly because if he does, he'll become bitter, barren, and broken. He's going to stand in the paths of sinners and sit with the seat of the scornful. He's going to be a skeptic. He's going to be against anything and everything. But blessed is a man who does not seek the counsel of the ungodly. And what does our flesh want to do? Always. We want to get people that's going to agree with us so it hurts less that we don't have to admit that we possibly could be wrong. Not only Psalm 1, Proverbs 12, 5. Look at what Proverbs 12, 5 says. The thoughts of the righteous are right, but the counsels of the wicked are deceitful. How about this? I hear it often. Now, Brother Brad, we got a concern. No, you don't. you got a gripe. Because if you was concerned about it, you'd go deal with it. You'd go see them. And better yet, you'd pray. You hear me? The words of the wicked are lying wait for blood, but the mouth of the upright will deliver them. Proverbs 13, verse 20 says this, He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. My mother used to say, birds of a feather flock together. Well, let me just say this, all buzzards roost in the same tree, and they're always around something dead. So you better look at your company. What about Proverbs 14, 6 and 7? Here's what Solomon writes. A scoffer, that's a word, isn't it, Brother Kyle? Seeks wisdom and does not find it. Paul says this is the way. They're always learning but never coming to the knowledge of truth. But knowledge is easy to him who understands. Go from the presence of a foolish man when you do not perceive in him the lips of knowledge. Just listen. Are y'all listening? Just listen and be obedient to Scripture. Proverbs 25, 5. Take away the wicked from before the king. Boy, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Where's these guys at? They're around the king. The king has surrounded himself with a bunch of wicked folks. Take away the wicked before the king and his throne will be established in righteousness. Proverbs 25, 19, confidence in an unfaithful man in the time of trouble is like a bad tooth and a foot, a foot out of joint. That'll bless you. Amen? How, how many of y'all would like to have the testimony you're like a bad tooth or a twisted broke ankle? He who hates, watch this, he disguises it with his lips. How does he do it? He flatters you. He disguises it with his lips, watch this, and lays up deceit within himself. He believes what he's saying. So what the king has done is he surrounded himself with those types of folks. See, the message of Esther is getting the wrong out and the right in. And the only way to get the wrong out and the right in is you got to get the right in so that the right makes the wrong lead. When he speaks kindly, do not believe him, for there are seven abominations in his heart. In other words, there's a perfect number of abominations in his heart. He's really out to get you. Though his hatred is covered by deceit, his wickedness will be revealed before the assembly. Whoever digs a pit will fall into it. And he who rolls a stone will have it rolled back on him. Amen. So I think it's clear that the Bible tells us not to do what he's done in chapter 1 and now it's a process that he's brought into chapter 2. He's continued to, to surround himself with ungodly, wicked counsel. But it pleased him and so therefore he goes, okay, let's do this. 
Not only do you find the candidates, but then you find the credentials. What are they looking for? What are the units looking for? Well, let me just give you a couple of them. Y'all ready? It's really five of them. Y'all ready? A couple sounded better, but y'all didn't amen, so I'm going to give you five of them. Number one, I want you to see their poten the potential. They had to be young. What does that mean? They had to be childbearing. In other words, they had to be young ladies that had never been married, and therefore... They were to be brought in. Now we know there's 127 provinces. And so if there's only one lady per province, that means there's 127. Josephus says there was over 400 ladies brought in. The, the Jewish historian. So we could say that Esther was one out of 400. Why? Because God's in control. Why? Because Genesis 3.15. Because Satan is going to do everything he can to destroy the bloodline. Now watch, I want you to hear this. Y'all say amen, you ready? Not only do they have the potential of being young, number two, they gotta be pure, they gotta be virgin. Man, could you imagine the parade going through each province? Could you imagine being the daddy of one of these girls? That the government has come in to take these girls out of your house and you can't say anything about it. You say, Brother Brad, this is pretty awesome. Oh, no, 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 hang on. We're going to, I'm going to show you how bad it really is. Whether well, they get to go to be the king. No, 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 just, just hang on. I'm going to show you what happens, amen? Not only they got to be pure, not only they got to be have potential, they got to be pretty. I mean, who wants an ugly wife, right? Who wants an ugly queen? They got to be pretty. They got to be beautiful. Now, remember, we got eunuchs that don't even like women going to pick this out. They were confused. Proven. They got to be proven. What do you mean they got to be proven? They got to be proven that they're virgins. That's the reason they have to wait for 12 months in the beauty parlor to make sure they're not with child. Did y'all get it? You say, man, it's going to take 12 months to get them beautified? Well, we'll cover that next week. But they have to wait 12 months. Because he wants to make sure that those other credentials are true. See, all of these credentials really brings benefits to the king's pride and his ego. The reason he's in the spot that he's in is because he wanted his wife, who was beautiful, Vashti, who was beautiful to come and dance around in front of all his drunken little buddies. And because she wouldn't do something ungodly, he got rid of her and wanted a pagan to come in. Little did he know God's behind the scenes working and he's going to get a little Jewish girl in the midst of his plan and thwart the whole thing. So you not only see the candidates, the credentials, you only see the conditions. Y'all ready to say amen? This is going to bless you. Because you say, Brother Brad, I'd volunteer if you was a girl in the, you say, I'd volunteer. No, 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 no. Because here's what's going to happen. If you wasn't chosen, you just put in the other harem and you were you were treated as a widow, even as a young girl, you're treated as a widow and you couldn't do anything else, but now you're a concubine. In other words, you're now enslaved. You're no longer, you can't just go back to the house. You're going to stay in there and the only time you're going to get to go to the king is when he wants you. That's exactly what the world does to you. When they're done, they'll move on to somebody else. That's a fact. That is a fact. Verse 14, let's read it. Let me back to verse 12. Each young woman's turn came to go in to King Ahasuerus after she had completed 12 months preparation according to the regulations for the women. For the, thus were the days of their preparation apportioned six months with oil and myrrh and six months with perfumes and preparations for beautifying women. Thus prepared, each young woman went to the king and she was given whatever she desired to take with her from the women's court of the king's palace. In the evening she went and in the morning she returned to the second house of the women to the custody of Shashgags, the king's eunuch who kept the concubines. She would not go into the king again unless the king delighted in her and called her for her by name. You go, so all these 400 women volunteered. No, they didn't. You know why? Because the conditions were if they didn't get chosen to be the queen, they became a slave in the second harem. See, basically what it was was basically a backup plan or a rainy day fund for the flesh. 
So what is the problem for the king? Look at verse 4. You got the process of the king, the picking of the king. What's the problem for the king? Verse 4 says, Then let the young women who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. This thing pleased the king, and he did so. Now in verse 1, he remembers Vashti, and he remembers the decree that was made against her, but he don't put himself in the one that made the decree. He just wishes that she was back. So what's the problem? Well, the problem of the king in verse 4 is the same problem that's with every man, woman, boy, and girl sitting in this room. If y'all ready, say amen. Number one, what did he want to do? He wanted to replace instead of repenting. Or we'll just act like it don't happen. Did you, did you hear what I just said? We'll just get another, we'll just get another queen. Regardless of what you did wrong in chapter 1, we'll just act like it didn't happen. Amen? See, here, here's, here's where we live in America. We live in free grace, which means all you got to do is pray a little prayer, throw a prayer up to God, and He'll forgive you for everything you've done. Why don't you get specific about your sin? Instead of saying, Lord, forgive me wherein thee I failed thee. Why don't you go ahead, go ahead and admit you're a liar? Why don't you admit that you exaggerate? Why don't you admit you're a prideful? Why don't you admit that you're self-centered? Why don't you admit that you are worried more about you than anybody else in this room? I'll tell you why, because we just want to replace them. I hear it all the time out of the, out of the mouths of people that profess Christ. Well, I was looking for a job and I found this one. But the Bible says work is unto the Lord. I was looking for a church when I found this one. I was looking, I was, I, 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 that's our problem. Replacing instead of repenting. See, it pleased him not just for at least 127 other women. It pleased him that he was going to get to replace Vashti. With ever, without ever admitting he was wrong. What's the problem of the king? He wants to replace without repenting. Number two, you ready? He wants to move on instead of mourning over. When's the last time you mourned over your own sin? Here's what the Bible says. He was broken over the conditions that he was in. Not over his condition. He could care less that Vashti has now been treated as a concubine for the last four years. He could care less that he's wronged a woman who has stood for the things that was right. See, he wanted to replace instead of repenting. He wanted to move on instead of mourning over. Ah. Uh, when's the last time you was really convicted and cut to the core? Or did you just feel bad about it? Number three, what's his problem? He was blaming instead of bowing. One of the, one, listen to me, I want everybody to look up here. One of the ways that you find out that Haman is the loudest voice in the palace that you, that's living inside of you is when you blame everybody but yourself. Go do prison ministry. You'll find out what I'm talking about. You go to prison ministry, do a Bible study. Everybody in prison is there because the system's broken. They're just at the wrong place at the wrong time. Really. Come on, work with me. What's the problem of the king? Replacing instead of repenting, moving on instead of mourning over, blaming instead of bowing. Number four. He was more about accusing instead of accepting responsibility. Well, if I just had a different 
Put it, whatever, put it in the blank. I hear this often, Brother Kyle, if I just had more time. Well, everybody's got 24 hours, seven days a week. Nobody has more time than you do. The difference is, Ephesians 5 says you've got to redeem what you do have. Man, if I had this, if I had that, if I could do this, if I could do that. Here's what's amazing. The king goes from verse 1 to verse 4 emotionally roller coaster from the valley to the mountain and nothing's changed in his life. By the time we get to chapter 7, he's drinking and partying again. By the time we get to chapter 10, he's, he's just like this. You know why? Because he listens to ungodly counsel and he never deals with the wrong voice. See, your flesh tells you you're okay. Your flesh blames everybody else. Haman blamed Mordecai and the Jews. We'll get to what the plot is next Sunday. But see, everybody in this room has the same problem. We want to look at somebody else's problem rather than our problem. And King Ahasuerus, I want you to listen to me. At this point in time, was the king of the largest kingdom in the world. Do you got me? He had more power and more prestige than anybody else in the known world. But he was so weak because he was concerned about what everybody else thought. So I want to ask you a question. Are you more concerned about repenting or are you more concerned about replacing? Are you more concerned about moving on or mourning over? Are you more concerned about bowing or blaming? Are you more concerned about accusing than accepting? The process, the thinking process of the king is let's just change the situation. Everything will be fine. Really? The picking for the king is going to be what emotionally makes me feel better. I just don't, you know, I'm, I want encouragement. So here's your encouragement. Repent. The greatest thing that everybody in this room can do today is repent. Because you'll never live in the fullness of King Jesus until King Ahasuerus and the Haman in your life is dealt with. Does that make sense? I want to ask you this question. When did your life become his life on his terms? Because most people sit in churches and they say that they're living for Jesus but it, they didn't come on his terms, they came on their terms. Lord, I'll do this if you'll do this. See, biblical Christianity is when you come to Christ on his terms, not yours. And it's no longer your life, but his. Because you've been bought with a price, and the life that you now live, you live by the faith in the Son of God who loved you and gave himself not only for you, but to you. See, if you don't understand these three truths, then when we get into Esther going, if I perish, I perish, and Mordecai saying, for such a time as this, you're never going to deal with the king Ahasuerus because you'll gloss it over and just move on. So in this room, here's the challenge for the day. Here's the takeaway. What voice are you listening to? You listen to ungodly counsel? Blessed is a man who does not walk in the counsel of the ungodly. He doesn't seat. Listen, he didn't, he didn't seat in the seat of the scornful. It's everybody else. Or 
And we're just simply going to repent to the right king. And whatever he says, we obey. Because that's the only way to really, truly live in accordance to the king. Well, Brother Brad, if I let somebody know, then they'll look at me different. Who cares what they say? Amen. Well, Brother Brad, if I get all in, then that means I've got to change my buddies I run around with. Amen. Get away from the buzzards. Amen. Brother Brad, if I, if I get all the way in, I surrender completely, which is the only way to surrender because if it's incomplete, it's not complete surrender. Then there will be different things that has to take place in my life. That's exactly right. But know this, then the darkness of the hour, there's a God that's behind the scenes whose name may not even be mentioned in your life that's pulling the strings to make everything work out because of Romans 8, 28 and 29 because we know all things work together for good who love the Lord and call according to His purpose. Why? Because God's going to do what God's going to do and you either can get in on it or get left out. Amen? Amen? So what are you going to pick today? What God says or what the eunuch says? Some of us need to take a moment and let the Lord beautify us. But before you can be beautified, there's got to be a preparation. What's the preparation? Admit that you need it. Because here's what the Bible says, and I'm done. Vashti was beautiful, and Esther was beautiful. But the king... Wanted to add to it. If I'll just do this or I'll do that, then things will be better. Over the last four years of your life, you got any regret? Over the last 40 minutes of your life, you got any regret? Over the last four minutes, you got any regret? You got any, you got any regret over the last week? What's the hope? Here's the hope. You ready? Take it to the true king, the Lord Jesus, and just simply obey what he says to do.